every believer will be confronted with the same challenges when trying to take decisions. If you have listened to my examples very well, you will have noticed that the permissive will of God is not necessarily a sin. You may not commit a sin when you walk in the permissive will of God. But of course it is better to be in the perfect will of God. Because when you are in the perfect will of God, you are doing exactly what God wants you to do. So, what I am suggesting to you is, you must try to identify the perfect will of God. And live in the perfect will of God, not in the permissive will. Are you still with me? I'm not in a hurry today because I need you to understand what I'm talking about. Perfect will, permissive will. There are two different dimensions. Perfect will is the real thing that God wants you to do part time. Whereas the permissive will are things that they are not exactly sinful, but they are not the real plan that God has for you. The reason why I'm talking about that is that there are plenty of believers who are living in the permissive will of God. And you can't really accomplish destiny when you live in the permissive will. I know a lady who was my colleague on campus those years ago who refused a marriage proposal because of the name of the man. I think I must have said it sometimes here before. Because somebody's name was... Uh, Eh? What do you call the name? <laughs> Somebody's name sounded like the name of a uh, cigarette. And you say, no, I can't marry him because his name is... What does name have to do with marriage? Names can be changed. If that's the will of God for you, then you straighten it. There's no, f no, no, no forest that becomes a farm. By itself. You have to till it. You have to clean it out. A number of things will happen. The man or the woman you're going to marry is not a perfect person yet. You're going to meet, change a lot of things. Both of you will change it together. Not that you're, you change it more. People don't, you can't change somebody, but the process of changes will take place and he will become what he needs to become. Some of you are in a relationship and then you are, you are, because the person doesn't look exactly like what you want, you are afraid. You two are not, you are not looking like the person he is looking for also. Huh? You will blend into each other. When we were cutting, my courtship lasted about six years. We, we broke several times. Huh? Several times we broke. Sometimes we went to pray. I drew a log back. I jalama jambe. Are they lie? Confirm. <laughs> we say we're going to pray. We get there and I quarrel, quarrel, quarrel. Because I will fight. I will say she doesn't know how to pray. She's not praying the way I want to pray. You know I mean. You know the way I pray. Even now. Eh? Action. She's a woman. She will come and she will sit down and she's praying. Ah, ah. How can you be seated and you are praying? You must stand up and pray. So we fought and fought every time. And then we will, I will start with Mio Shimo, Mio Shimo. Go. Go. Go your way. I go my way. And I will land in my room and God will say, What is wrong with you? What stubborn boy you? Must she pray like you pray? One day we are going to preach somewhere. And she wore one dress. Ha! Devil! I was, you know, <laughs> remember Mozambique called. I came, I came to pick her 
And she came out in one dress. Eh? I cast out the devil. <laughs> and she ended up going back. She's not going again. She's not even marrying me again. Me too. I said, go away. I'm not marrying. I don't want any devil. And I went to preach my message alone. You know those days I was a very stubborn preacher. I was, ha, pretty stubborn. If you see my beard, <laughs> you even fear. I was like Josiah, prophet. <laughs> prophet Josiah. <laughs> it's Isaiah. Eh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How did I get into that now? All right, so well, what I was trying to say is that how can you refuse a marriage proposal because of somebody's name? I know somebody who refused another one because he couldn't use cutleries. <laughs> so he couldn't use cutleries. Fork and knife. He say, I cannot marry him. Uh, Another one refused somebody because he saw, she saw that he was going to become a preacher. <laughs> and she had made up her mind she would never marry a preacher. All these people I'm talking about, they are human beings, you know. I know them. Some of them are regretting now. That one who said he has, he's going to be a preacher, marry somebody who will not be a preacher now. And that person has died. And she became a widow so early in life. Is it God that gave her that? She settled for the permissive will. Left off the perfect will of God for her. You know something? You can't, God cannot force you. He's not going to force you on anything. He will only tell you his plan for you. If you refuse it, he will leave you alone. And allow you to operate in the permissive will. That's why I'm teaching it. Permissive will, most times, may not be seen. Is it sinful? That lady who said she will not marry somebody because he's, uh, he bears uh, the name of cigarettes. Had she committed a sin? She's not probably going to hell for that. If she goes to hell, it will be for something else. But she never got married. She never got married. Up until now. When she refused what God was giving to her, she refused the perfect will of God and settled for a permissive will. Is it the will of God for her to remain single all life? She refused the plan of God. I think they set you for the permissive will of God. Kenneth Hagin of Blessed Memories was the first person who taught this subject that I had from. He might not be the first person, but I had it from him the first time. Perfect will and permissive will. And he gave his personal example. He said when he received a call, you know, he had a dramatic call. He was um, paralyzed and he was on bed. He couldn't even walk. And then the power of God came down and healed him. And he received a call straight away to heal the sick and to set people free. So it was a dramatic call that he got from the beginning. But as soon as he got his call, he accepted to be a pastor over a church. Because that was the normal thing. Every pastor, every, every preacher was a pastor. Everybody is on a church somewhere. So he just thought that was the normal thing. And he became a pastor over one congregation. And he was battling with it. The church was not doing well. He himself was not happy. He knew something was wrong in his life. But he didn't understand what it was. So one day, he locked himself in the church. 
and gave the key to his wife. Go away. Don't come to open the door unless I call you. And he stayed there. Days. Lock himself inside the church. Just began to pray and pray. That he couldn't go further in life until God would speak to him. What is going on in my life? So he, he locked himself there and he was praying. Eventually, the Lord visited him there. And the Lord explained to him that he was operating in the permissive will of God. God told him that he wasn't meant to be a pastor. Yes, I called you, but you are not meant to be a pastor. The assignment for you is to be an itinerant teacher of the word. That he will be going from church to church doing teaching crusades. He had never seen anybody uh, done that before. So he never imagined that that was possible. But that's what God said about him. He said that is his assignment. Not to be on a church as a pastor. And so he obeyed God. He resigned from the church. And as soon as he resigned, things began to fall in place. People began to invite him from different churches. And he was doing teaching meetings all over the place. And it was so blessed, so powerful, so impactful. And he, he, he realized that now he was on his trail. He was now doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And he was in a time of prayer with God. And God said, you know, if you had not come to ask me, I wouldn't have said anything. And there are plenty of people like that. God told him that there are plenty of my servants like that who are wasting away. They never started the first phase of their life, the first phase of their ministry. God told him that when he resigned from that church, that was the beginning of the first phase of his ministry. So he taught on the subject of the perfect will and the permissive will of God. When he was pastoring that church, he was preaching, he was doing God's work, but he was not in the perfect will of God. He was doing the permissive will of God. Are you still with me? Let me quickly mention some dangers of staying in the permissive will of God. Number one, you will be unconsciously living in disobedience. If you live, if you operate in the permissive will of God, you will be living a disobedient life, though unconsciously. And the meaning of that is when you get to heaven, when you give your account before the Lord, you are not likely to receive rewards. Because you didn't even do the things that God wanted you to do. You lived all your life in the permissive will. There can't be any reward for that. That is if you don't end up in hell. Because the tendency for you to go to hell is very high. Because you will be walking contrary to God. You will need to defend. You will need to fight for yourself. You need to do so many things by yourself. And the chances are so high that you will fall into sin. So that's the first danger. You will be living in disobedience. Number two, you are exposed to the devil. When you are living in disobedience, when you are in the permissive will, you will be exposed to the devil. You know, God told Jacob to go to Bethel and live there. But when he got to Bethel, he just made a sacrifice. And the Bible said, and they left Bethel again. God told him, go make a sacrifice in Bethel and live in Bethel. But when he got there, he made the sacrifice, but he did not live there. He got up and continued his journey. And then a number of events happened to him. The Bible said, on their way to Ephrata, his wife 
had hard labor. And she died in the process of delivery. I am convinced that if Jacob was dwelling in Bethel, where God said he should dwell, that lady wouldn't have died. I am convinced. The Bible did not say so. I am convinced that when you are in your place of primary assignment that God placed you, the covenant of God will take care of challenges that are coming. His daughter Dina was raped. His son Reuben was found in incest with his wife Bilhah. And all kinds of strange things were happening in the life of Jacob. When you live in the permissive will of God, or you operate in the permissive will of God, you are not secure. The enemy will attack you easily and he will succeed. But when you are in the perfect will of God, you are protected. That's number two. Number three, the voice of God will desert you when you operate in the permissive will. Because the voice of God often follows perfect directions. When, you, when God tells you, do this and you are doing it, then he will speak to you again. When he tells you where to dwell and you are dwelling there, his voice will be clear to you. But the moment you are living in the permissive, the voice of God will be, will be far away from you. It will desert you. Look at the story of Abraham. For almost 15 years, after he went and slept with Agar, he didn't hear the voice of God once. For 15 years. God didn't speak to Abraham again. Until after 15 years. And then God came back and brought him back to track. I think this is a serious issue. Because I feel that's the reason why most of our ministers don't hear the voice of God. Because he never commissioned them to do what they are doing. They are operating in the permissive will of God. And let me tell you something. It is easy to operate in the permissive. Very, very easy. Because you don't need to do anything. You just do your thing. Just do normal things. Time. Let me leave it. Number four. Abraham had to lie about his wife, Sarah, when he left Canaan to go to Egypt. You know, Canaan was the perfect will of God for Abraham. He went to Egypt and God permitted him. So I would say that was permissive will. And why did he go to Egypt? You remember the story? Because there was going to be a famine. And Abraham was afraid. So because of fear, he went to Egypt. And because of that fear, he had to lie that Sarah was his sister. When you dwell in the permissive will, Fear will come stronger. You become afraid. You live in fear. You operate in fear. Everything will be in fear. Because you are outside of purpose. But when you are in the will of God, you will be bold. The Bible says the righteous is as bold as a lion. The moment you are outside the perfect will of God, you are afraid. Fear would take over your heart. And number five, which is the last point I want to make. I think people say, I think oh, from my own observation. All these things I'm saying are my own observation. So. And you don't have to take it to they're just my own observation. So, you know, in Africa, pastors, we are fine now. Whatever we say, you just say yes, sir. Is that not so? Look at the way I've been the one talking since. And all of you are looking at me as though you don't know how to talk. Because in Africa, 
man of God is uh, is representative of God. No arguments. I preached in one church in Canada the other time. One young man said, that's not true. <laughs> one white guy like this. He said, Pastor, that's a lie. That's not true. <laughs> I was just looking at him like this. <laughs> I've never seen it before. Ah, that pastor told a lie. He said, it's a lie. You are not correct. He said, see, see. And he showed me in, that, in the scripture. He said, that scripture did not say what you said. <laughs> and sincerely, truly, the scripture did not say, I only inferred. And that taught me a little bit about preaching more. That's why I came back. When I came back, you didn't know. But I came back and started doing practical discussion. And I allowed people to ask questions what I said. It was that guy. He said, Pastor, you're a liar. You're, it's not correct. <laughs> hey. And today now, we Christians, we pastors are angry because people are criticizing us. You should be happy that they are criticizing us. They must criticize us. Also so that we can behave. Kaukwa, awani, awa, tawalori, okay. Because you hear all kinds of things. God says the Lord, every woman in this church, I must give, get you pregnant. Ah! On the altar. And we are bold, we say it, and we don't care. And nobody asks questions. Everybody say, yes, sir. I saw one in one video like this. One pastor said, on Sunday, I must bless all your panties. Everybody bring your pants to church on Sunday. I'm going to bless your pants. I thought... <laughs> I, I felt that must be the craziest thing I've ever had. All these people will not come to church on that day. Come and see all kinds of panties. <laughs> When it was time, he said, lift up your... Ah. Ha! BBC London recorded it. I saw it on BBC. BBC London. So let them criticize us so, so that we can move forward. In conclusion. Ah, I was talking about number five. Did I finish it? I'll be a good boy. Don't worry. She's looking at me the way my mother used to look at me. <laughs> All right. I said people who stay in the permissive will of God die faster than those who stay in the perfect will. They often die faster. And I'll give you a few examples. Eli Melech died before his time because he was in the permissive will. He wasn't an old man. His sons died before their time because they were in the permissive will of God. What about Samson? Samson also died before his time because he was operating in the permissive will of God. And let me add one more. Balaam. He died also too early because he was living in the permissive will of God. When you live in the permissive will, your life can be cut short. You may die faster than the time that heaven has allotted for you. Because you wouldn't even be fulfilling purpose. Even the Bible says in John chapter 15 verse 2, He that does not bear good fruit, he shall cut down. So anything can happen when you live in the permissive will. So in conclusion, the perfect will of God is the best option for every believer. But sometimes we find ourselves in situations that are not immediately sinful, but are not exactly what God wants us to do. 
These are the permissive will of God. It is important to know that if you stay in the permissive will of God, you will be eventually soaked in sin. If you stay in the permissive will of God, the tendency is high that you will eventually fall into sin. For instance, I've met a lot of people who live abroad. They live abroad not because God wanted them there, but just because they like the place. And for them to be able to sustain that interest, some of them have had to do many things a child of God should not do. And that's not good enough. You don't need to do that. Each one of them, when I meet them, I often tell them this. You are a king. And you have a throne. Your throne is waiting for you somewhere. But you are loitering around. When you see kings that are loitering around, they are to be pitied. Real kings don't loiter. Find out where exactly the Lord wants you to live in and stay there. Generally, my candid opinion, my candid advice to everybody is that you should do your best to stay in the perfect will of God because you are safer there. The perfect will of God includes where, when, how, and things like that. When does God want you to do this thing? So it is not enough to know that God wants you to go to America. When does he want you to go? How does he want you to go? That's the perfect will. So the fact that God wants you to go to America is not enough. You must identify how, when, and do it exactly the way he wants it done. It's not enough that I know that God wants me to marry. Who should I marry? And when should I marry? Oh, it's not enough that I am in marriage. I must be obedient to God's will, even in marriage. What am I doing in the home? How am I running my home? Is my lifestyle in, in, in the family something to, I mean, make God happy? Am I in the perfect will of God? In every aspect of your life, you must be able to identify the perfect will of God and do it. Even when you get a job, in your place of work, there may be a perfect will that God has on mind. Maybe God wants you to start a fellowship in your company. Maybe God wants you to touch the life of somebody there. That is the perfect will. You need to identify what is the perfect will of God. Let me round it up with this personal story. I was getting ready to go for a crusade some years ago. Our office was still in Mokola at that time. The church was Mokola at that time. So I, I, I left from uh, Apata. I was living in Apata. And drove to Mokola because I needed to pack books from my office that I would distribute in the crusade. As I ran into the office, I was already running late. I ran into the office to pack the books. And I was putting them in a curtain. And then the Holy Spirit said, where are you going? And I'm like, where am I going? I've been praying about these crusades since the beginning of the year. How come you are asking me where am I going? He said, because I didn't send you. And that was strange to me. You didn't send me? The Bible says, go ye into the whole world. And I quoted the scripture to the Lord. He said, yes, that is for everybody. But for you, I didn't send you on this crusade. I said, I don't know that you need to send me to any place. I think we should go everywhere. As long as there are needs. 
as long as people have not had the gospel, we should tell them the gospel. He said, no. Yes, you will tell people around you, but that you will embark on a crusade. I need to instruct you to do it. And I said, I don't understand, Lord. What do you want me to do now? He said, sleep. Sleep. Don't go on this crusade. Sleep. There was a sofa in my office. So I lie down on the sofa. I can't sleep. How can I sleep? They are waiting for me on crusade. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes passed. After 15 minutes, I said, Lord, I'm still lying down. He said, you did not remove your shoe. I thought he would say, okay, go and when you come, we'll talk. He said, remove your shoe and sleep properly. I said, but they are waiting for me in the crusade. The Lord said, if you die on the road, they will mourn you. And they will do their things. Sleep, sleep. So I removed my shoes. And I slept. About one hour later, I woke up. I said, so what should happen? He said, go home. Go home. Unfortunately, that time there was no phone. So I couldn't even phone them to tell them what happened. I just went to my house and slept. The following day, God said, now let me tell you something. I am your ministry. It's not activity. Don't do activity. Follow me. Whatever I tell you to do, that is what you do. If I tell you, go, go. If I don't send you, don't go. That's how I began to learn perfect will of God. There's a song we used to sing when I was smaller than this, when we were on campus. It's not my grammar. It's not my grammar. But I will sing it all the same. I'm going to stay right under the blood. I'm going to stay right under the blood. I'm going to stay right under the blood. Where the devil can't do me no harm. Uh -huh. I'm going to stay right under the blood. Where the devil can do me no harm. I will stay where the Lord wants me to be. In the perfect will of God. Where the devil can do me no harm. Let's rise up on our feet. We are going to pray. I'm sorry I can't teach you the song. Because it's not, my, it's not my grammar. But I can lead you to pray. I don't want to live my life in the permissive will of God. I will live in the perfect will of God always. Can you pray that prayer? I want to live in the perfect will of God all the time. Give me grace. Pray, pray, pray. Ask for grace. It's challenging, you know. When every other person is doing what they like, it's challenging to walk in the perfect will of God. Ask for grace. The Bible says, They that ask get receive it. Ask for grace. I told myself, From now, I will not do anything unless I'm sure it is the will of God. Only the will of God. The perfect will of God. There are many things you get yourself involved with that you don't need to get involved with. There are many things you get yourself into that you're not supposed to even get into. And then you trap yourself. You create all kinds of problems for yourself. Balaam killed himself before his time. Elimelech killed himself before his time. Samson killed himself before his time. They stepped out of purpose. I will stay right in purpose. 
in the perfect will of God for my life. Tell him, tell him, I need grace to, do, to stay there. I need grace to stay there. Help me. Now for you to be able to stay there, you need to understand it. Give me understanding of divine purpose. Teach me understanding to understand divine purpose for my life. Help me to understand. Shakala mashai dabaya. Rebarote soteli abashanta yaba. In Jesus' name we pray. Listen to me. We are still going to pray. I was sharing it with some ministers in a ministers' meeting yesterday over there in uh, Ayego. There is no obedience you do to God that will increase the height of God. That will increase the glory of God. That will make God greater. Say, ah, it was because you obeyed him yesterday he became greater. No. There is no obedience you do to God that makes him greater. And there is no disobedience you do that will submerge or belittle God. He remains God all the time. It is your own status that will keep on changing. Your obedience will make you greater. Your disobedience will bring you down. So you are going to pray. Lord, teach me to understand divine purpose. I want to understand divine purpose for my life. So that I can walk in it. Can you pray that prayer? Give me understanding. Many things that God is saying you don't understand. Because you don't know tomorrow. Give me understanding. Hey. Shela me me ho nira gado esidaya. Mare la me kote shunaya me pato shedaye. Hold on a bit. You don't understand what I'm saying. Hold on. Hold on. I went to pray one day. And God said, don't come to pray here again. I was, it was, it was in usage. I beg you. That one place under the tree in usage where we pray. I went to pray there. And God said, don't come to seek me here again. You will find me here again. I said, ah, you are traveling, Lord. He said, I don't travel. He said, starting from today, you must always come to meet me in the forest. In the land that I gave to you. In New He said, that's where you will meet me now. Now, you don't know what that means. Ilaitura was pure forest at that time. It was difficult for me to get there. And I said, Lord, why are you being wicked to me? Why are you punishing me? Why must I go inside the forest to talk to you? And he told me, you don't understand. You don't understand. Until you break the high men of that land, you will not step into your glory. Look. Every instruction God is giving is for you, not for him. He doesn't get better because of your obedience. Today I live in Ilaitua. I know what God was saying at that time. But I didn't understand it at that time. Thank God I had learned to obey him even when I don't understand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have left that level where I was at that time. I was a beggar. Surviving on everything that people give to me at that time. But now, I operate in glory because I obeyed his voice. You are still going to pray once more. Understanding, Lord. Grant me understanding of purpose so that I can walk in purpose. Can you pray that prayer once more? that I will understand and I will be able to walk in purpose give me understanding give me understanding Maleka Shataya Mombro Setedi Asetaya 
that part of my soul I give you full control wherever you may be I will follow I have made a choice to listen for your voice wherever you may lead I will go shepherd of my soul shepherd of my soul 